Hello again, you sick, twisted weather freaks, and welcome to another fun-filled, action-packed, and intellectually stimulating edition of This Week in Weather. I'm your host, meteorologist DT from weatherist.com, the colonel of confusion, the captain of catastrophe, the commander of chaos. It's time to talk about weather, which is probably the greatest subject of all time. And this particular issue of This Week in Weather, we'll talk about the end of the summer heat. We'll talk about actual favorable pattern developing in the tropics. Good googly moogly, can I take the strain? Cold frost and the uh, frost scare for the plains in the Midwest. We'll talk about that a little bit. And then also some of the climate models and what they're showing for the winter. So let's get right to it. Lots to talk about. And I'm sure you, like myself, enjoy the sound of my own voice. We'll talk about the uh, first of summer in review. Now this represents the precipitation relative to normal for all the country for the heart of the summer. Uh, June, uh, July, and all of August, as you can see. And it was a pretty wet summer in most areas. You know, if you look at the upper Midwest and the plains, a lot of areas which saw anywhere from uh, 150 to 200 percent of normal, 125 to 200 percent of normal, but not many, uh, not all areas. There were some dry spots there. Texas was dry. The Rockies did pretty well. That's interesting. Look at Idaho and Nevada, Utah, Montana, uh, Wyoming. They did pretty good. Uh, the southeast states, not that well. Look at the, the conditions over Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, even to central Virginia. Uh, quite the below normal rainfall there, 50 to 75 percent. Not a severe drought, but certainly pretty drier than normal in that area. With respect to uh, temperatures, uh, the summer, uh, was anybody hot? Uh, not east of the Rockies, no. It was a pretty nice summer, actually. No complaints at all. Very typical uh, El Nino summer. And if you look at our heating degree days relative to normal, again, look how uh, much below normal it was across all of the Midwest, even into Arkansas, Louisiana, Tennessee. I mean, you don't, those, these areas don't normally see heating degree days. If you look at that blue blob there, that's 200 to 300 heating degree days below normal. Uh, the cooling degree days, I should say, not heating, cooling degree days for the summer. That's also quite cool. Look at the cooling degree days up in South Dakota as well, also quite in, uh, below normal there. So all in all, a very cool summer. And now, of course, that doesn't mean that it wasn't hot last week as we go out of August and September. It was very hot here on the East Coast, all up in the Maine, relative to normal. The Midwest was also quite warm. That red represents, you know, 8 degrees, 6, 8, 9 degrees Fahrenheit above normal. That's pretty toasty. But look over those Rockies and the upper plains there. Here comes the colder air beginning to make its impact. Now, if you take a look at the current conditions, now this map here represents rainfall as of uh, 10 o'clock last night. Uh, and, of course, more additional rainfall has fallen. But you can see how impressive this rain has been over the last two days in the southeast of Virginia. Uh, notice I have that little uh, area circled there. Uh, that orange blob represents over six inches of rain. I've seen reports on some observers which have posted on the Facebook page and have sent me some emails of over 11 inches in places like Smithfield and uh, Portsmouth and Chesapeake, so very impressive rain. Also look at central and eastern North Carolina, uh, the Outer Banks, everybody there as well, also significant rain. So uh, really quite impressive here with the rain. And that rainfall is part of what's ending the heat. Uh, a lot of heat and warmth and humidity in the atmosphere, and this rain is taking it out and beginning to cool the atmosphere down. Now if we look at the next five days, this is from uh, the... Uh, a Monday afternoon GFS, you can see a lot of rain here over the Midwest with this next front coming in. And you can see it right in here with all the significant rain in this area here. Here's the East Coast rain with the first stalled front. And this is the next cold front coming through this way, driving it south and east. And it brings significant rain to the Western Corn Belt areas and the Upper Great Lakes for that matter. Um, and if we look at our frost conditions now, this is from September 5th, the GFS, the coldest of all the models, once again, not a surprise. Although the Canadian had some runs, which are also quite chilly. I notice that it has temperatures here, 26, 27, and here, pockets of it here. Not a big, giant frost, but certainly cold, cold enough uh, that could do some damage to some of the late uh, crops in these areas, grains, if the temperatures get this cold, but they might not, like I said. Uh, the GFS is coldest. This is a couple days later here. This is on September 6th. And again, for the morning of the 13th, a very impressive pocket here um, over the uh, Wisconsin, southeast of Minnesota, northeastern Iowa. And when this map came out a couple days ago, it caused quite a reaction in the grain markets. But again, I believe it's probably overdone when you compare it to the European. Indeed, this is the European and this is uh, from uh, September 8th, the uh, morning run here on the European. And you can see that uh, that uh, dark green area in here, as you can see it, let me highlight so you can see uh, all this dark green area in here. See all this? This is uh, a 30, 35 degrees. So, eh, you know, marginal, not 
a real big monster frost, but certainly more than scattered frost. And I think that's a pretty reasonable assessment of things. Now, as we go beyond that, this is the day six European model. We can see that if the high does, in fact, come southward, and we do get a lot of uh, a cooling here on the east coast. Finally, the rain drives all the rain off the coast here. Nice, big, high, very impressive, very, very ideal conditions. Here's our ridge on the west coast. That squiggly line is the international symbol for a ridge at 500 millibars, in case you didn't know that. Here's our trough here in the Aleutian Islands. There's our polar vortex developing very nicely here over Hudson's Bay. Overall, a very nice autumn-looking pattern, early autumn. Let's take a look at the tropics here. This is Disturbance 91L from the satellite picture on the Monday at midday. Very impressive-looking system, as you can see here. Uh, if we look at the dust, the dust is now to the north. So finally, we're getting this big monster cloud of dust out of the way. So that looks encouraging. And if we look at our sea surface temperature maps, this is the warmest the tropical Atlantic has been all season relative to normal. And that's an encouraging sign. We're getting warm water developing instead of that uh, ice cold water off the, in the eastern Atlantic, which has been the problem here for most of uh, uh, August. So that's encouraging. So this system has the potential to develop into a significant tropical event. Now, if we look at the MJO here, we can see that here's the red arrow. You see the red arrow? That's uh, September 7th. Uh, all the models show essentially not doing anything. It's stuck in the neutral zone, the circle zone, what's known as the circle of death. And it doesn't do much at all. And if we look at the climate, if we look at these different uh, you know, models here, this is the European, and you can see it doesn't do anything. The ensembles, the European, they all keep it, uh, drifting around here, not doing anything uh, in the stuck of, uh, in the circle of the neutral zone over the next uh, two weeks. So that's that means the MGO essentially is dead. It's not doing anything. It'll wake up later on, I'm sure, but right now it's not a factor. So if we look at the different models, we can see that, uh, well, we have a problem with the system. Now, the European develops the system quite nicely, and we'll use the European here since it's obviously been superior uh, in not developing systems prematurely, as which the Canadian, the British, and the uh, GFS have all done. So we want to be conservative here, and indeed the European has the system developing nicely. But notice the monster storm this baby has. Look at this gargantuan pig sitting here in the northeast Atlantic by the Azores. Now what that does is that weakens the ridge in the eastern Atlantic and that allows the system to gain some latitude so it passes north of Puerto Rico as you can see here uh, on uh, Friday morning and then this is on uh, Monday night uh, there's a big high in the Atlantic Ocean as you can see and but the big trough is now coming through the east coast. This is the same cold front which is going to bring the frost you know to the upper plains of the Midwest or potential frost, and significant cooling to the east coast. Well, that trough sweeps off the east coast, and that ensures that this system, however powerful it becomes, and it'll probably develop into a significant hurricane, is going to be kicked way out to sea and not be a threat to the eastern United States. You know, I don't see how it's going to survive this monster trough coming in. It's just not going to happen, folks. All right, now this is the uh, day 10 European map, and we can see the system on the European uh, quite nicely. The model has developed it quite, as you can see right here. But look at this. There's an next reinforcing trough here, a big, broad trough this way. Here's our ridge on the west coast. Uh, at that 91L, if it becomes a tropical storm or hurricane, it ain't coming to the east coast, not in this pattern. And we can see this in day 9. Uh, this is uh, with the European, the GFS, then the uh, Canadian, and they all show basically the same thing. This is a pretty good model agreement. Notice the ridge here. Let me highlight these features so you can follow this along. Notice the ridge here on the, we on the uh, uh, west coast. See this right here? All the models have it. See it? There you go. The Canadian is a little weaker. Big ridge. Look at the uh, Royal Ridge here by eastern Siberia, and the, also the Scandinavian ridge. That's also a promising sign for the winter because often these things retrograde in the winter pattern. And they all have a polar vortex and a trough on the east coast. You can see that as well, the polar vortex and the trough on the east coast. So overall, the models are in very strong agreement. It's going to look like a day 9, day 10, day 11, the pattern. And with the trough on the east coast, you're not going to get an east coast hurricane, not in this pattern. Um, so that's that. All right, uh, let's take a look at the uh, El Nino. We can see the warm water is redeveloping here at the subsurface temperatures coming up very nicely. The Japanese continue to insist that the El Nino is going to be centered not off of Peru, but in the central, Atlanta, in the central equatorial Pacific, which is called the Motokai uh, El Nino, and that's better for East Coast winters and colder winter and snowier patterns, as we talked about last in the last uh, of this week in weather. So uh, that's a encouraging sign. Here's a current sea surface temperature map. Let's take a look at these are actual conditions, not forecasts. These are facts, and the facts are more important than theories and ideas at this point in time. So we can see a very impressively humongous amount of warm water here in the northern Pacific Ocean. Good, 
googly moogly. This is impressive. The Atlantic is warming up quite nicely, as you can see, and the El Nino is not showing up all on the equator right here at all, as you can see. So the warm water in the North Pacific is what's driving the pattern. That's the important thing to take away from this. Now, if we look at the trends, what's trending? Well, we can see the Atlantic Ocean is warming up in the tropical Atlantic, especially the subtropical Atlantic. Notice the warm water actually appears to be increasing in the Gulf of Alaska and the northern Pacific. Can you believe that? And then significant cooling off the coast of Japan and Kamchatka. So, uh, and no cooling also off the coast of Peru and the remains of the El Nino there. So that's the trend going on. Now, I wanted to point out to you some of the winter forecasts that are coming out here. This is a fake winter forecast. Uh, it's, it's from Empire News, which is a satire like The Onion. Uh, unfortunately, even though it says it's a joke, um, I've been hit by seven emails, seven, from people asking me, what do I think about this forecast? They're not reading it. They're not following it through. They're not realizing that not everything on the Internet is 100% accurate and true. So uh, you need to pay attention and follow this stuff all the way through and consider the sources, folks. This is a fake weather forecast. It's satire. Okay. Let's take a look at some of the climate models from last autumn for last winter. Now, the CFS this far out had no clue, zero. Let's take a look at it quickly. This is the CFS from uh, early September, and this is for last winter. Now, notice what it's showing here. It... Um, for last winter, let me call up my market here. This is for December. It was very warm, very warm in January, and all had the warmth up here, a little cooling in February. So it did not have a clue that the winter was going to be really bad. This is from October. And again, look at December. Uh, and down in here, you can see December here. And this is January. Look how warm it was. Look at how warm February was. It never showed the cold air at all, the cold winter pattern at all. So uh, you need to take that consideration. Now this is, uh, this, the, and this is, the CFS for locally for September. Now, once you get within a mo month or two, the CFS has some pretty good skill. Now, this is from mid, uh, this is early August for September. Had a little bit of cooling here over the Dakotas, normal temperatures otherwise. This next one is from the middle of August, showing more cool air developing for September. And then this one here is the latest one at the end of August into early September for the entire month of September. And it has a large area of below and much below normal temperatures over the upper Midwest and the upper plains in central Canada. So once you get within a month or so, then the CFS develops some skill, but not really until then. Now, this is for January 15th. This is the current CFS for next January. Look how warm it is. Pretty impressive. Now, if we look at the actual pattern, that makes no sense. The actual upper air pattern shows a ridge on the west coast, a trough off the east coast, and a positive phase of the western Pacific Oscillation. This should be a fairly cold pattern, so it doesn't make any sense. This is February. The current CFS in September for February 2015. Very warm in the Rockies and western Canada, normal temperatures on the east coast. And if you look at the air, upper air pattern, again, that makes no sense. Huge ridge on the west coast, big trough on the east coast, it should show a cold pattern. So the CFS is not matching itself here, the service map and the upper air pattern. Now the Japanese models are a little different. They were a little better. Now this was the Japanese model from September of last year. Had warm over the western United States, warm in the eastern United States. Okay? This was from uh, uh, largely September. This you can largely you can see again how warm it was. And then this one here is again uh, this is going to be October, and this is an enlargement of October. Very warm in the eastern United States, cold in the Pacific Northwest, as you can see. And then this is November. Finally, in November, the Japanese model began to get a clue and started dropping temperatures over the Midwest and the eastern United States. Finally, it began showing that. Not until November. There's a reason for that. Okay, and this is now. Now this is the May forecast. Now, th and let me show you when the model starts getting good. This is the May forecast for June, July, and August. And let me enlarge it so you can see it here. Now, this is for the summer. The Japanese model in May for the summer predicted below normal temperatures over the plains, the Midwest, no heat. That's exactly what we just saw. So the model, once it got within a month, was pretty good for uh, one, two, or three months out. But not until you get within a month. And this is the rainfall map. And again, let me enlarge this. Again, look how wet it was here over the plains in the Midwest. And uh, look how dry it was over India. It actually predicted the drought over India and the rains, excessive rains in central and southeastern China. Once you got within a month. Okay. Now, this is the current one. This is August for December, January, February this year. It's very cold. It is, now, you, if you like winter, you love this map here because this is showing a lot of cold temperatures, but it's several months out yet. We don't know if it's true or not, so you have to take with a great deal of skepticism. And this is the rainfall map, precipitation map, for the winter. 
that's a lot of precipitation over the deep south. If you're in the eastern United States, if you're in the southeastern states, and you want a lot of winter and snow, this is the map you want to look at. But again, it's August. It's not reliable yet. We have to get closer to it. So that's the whole point. This is meteorologist DT from weatherist.com. I'll talk to you soon.